One Piece Episode 4, continuation of the story, started in Episode 3. So by the end of this episode, we have a resolution of that particular baddie of the week, or baddie of the two weeks in this case. So we, I can talk a little bit more freely, and if I blend things from the other episode, then so be it. So in this particular episode, we saw that Zoro was bopped on the head and thrown down a well, a dry well, and that the guy who was looking after the finances of Kaya, Kaya, was killed by the pirate and also thrown down the well. We've learnt that Usip, Aesop, whatever his name is, in the middle, yes, we already know he's a perpetual liar, but he was willing to stand by his friend even when she told him to go. Just leave me alone and he did the right thing. He knew what was the right thing in his heart and that was not to just abandon her to be taken out by the bad pirates. He was going to do the right thing. Then we have Nami on the left. Now, I talked about her in the previous review of episode three. And that was how I felt that she had a nice little change in her arc. It doesn't mean she's going to maintain that, but just for that one episode, she did. And then, of course, we find out that Luffy is immune to poison or it doesn't affect him as quick or as bad as it will affect other people as he's made of rubber. And he basically drank the whole poison soup, which had been used to poison Kaya for years. And he just drank it all in one go and they thought he was dead, but he simply wasn't dead. We also had the arc of the Marines, which is Kobe coming to, I guess, arrest the pirates or whatever. Leading to this particular house. And of course, they end up getting Luffy out of the house, which was a great they're about to kill the guy or throw him down the well, but you know, kind of rescued by the Marines so he could throw the poison up and then everything was great. Zoro got thrown down the well. Zoro managed to climb back out of the well. Now, we had an interesting backstory with Zoro's flashbacks in this one where he was learning to be... His desire was to be the great fighter. Now, the... One of the most honest lines was in this episode when he was fighting the girl whose name escapes me at the moment and I'm not going to even try and pronounce her name. And he could not beat her. And she said a statement of fact is that I might, bite, I might be able to beat you as a boy, but when you become a man, You'll be taller, stronger, and quicker than I will ever be. It's just a statement of fact that a 100 kilo guy will be stronger than a 100 kilo girl, all things being equal. Now, if you say, well, it's a 100 kilo girl that's been doing CrossFit, and it's a 100 kilo guy who's totally out of shape, well, then the CrossFit girl will probably strong, be stronger. However, we're not talking about the exceptions to the general rule, such as that Olympic athlete female can beat most guys in the world at a 100 meter race. Well, of course she can, but most guys in the world aren't training to be good at a 100 meter running. So you have to look at horses for courses sort of a thing. So I like that honesty, but of course he tried to play it up that, you know, she could still be she could still be the greatest swordsman in the world, swordswoman in the world, as long as she did things to overcome where she lacked. So clearly she would not be as tall, she wouldn't have as long a reach as she even alluded to, and she would not be as strong. So she would have to overcome those weaknesses in some other way, shape or form. So in that sense, it was great that he was basically alluding to the fact that if you've got a weakness, you can try and overcome it. So I liked that. But to deny the reality of physics, I thought it was a not so great. Okay. 
but his story arc and his flashbacks, so we kind of see his motivation, why he carries three swords and so on and so forth. That was really interesting. Doesn't change him as a character to me, except, you know, it might hint at why he seems to be a little bit melancholy all the time because he lost his best friend. Of course, the surprise twist at the end is that the Scottish sounding or whatever the hell sounding guy he is running the ship for the Marines going after them is actually Luffy's grandfather. So how that all comes about, maybe we'll find out, maybe we don't. Now remember, I haven't read the comic, so I have no idea if people in the comics already know that at this point. And here we see the scene where they've all just, he's looking at the, the he's looking through the eyeglass, the lens, or whatever they call it in this show, and he sees the thing and he says, Grandpa, and they're all like, Grandpa? So they understand that he's looking at his grandfather. His grandfather is trying to kill him. Okay. So we have the resolution. The bad, fast pirate doesn't die. He escapes. We've also discovered that a pirate with a shark fin or a, a, what's the name of that shark that's got the interesting nose, like sawtooth nose. Saw, he, he, as a pirate, has had dealings with the clown pirate. So we have to assume that now that the knives pirate is escaping, he will bump into him as well. So they'll probably also team up in some way, shape or form. That's my prediction. And so far, my predictions are not very good in the movies that I predict things in. But that's the prediction that I see based on the one piece of evidence already of one pirate enlisting the help of another pirate to try and get this Luffy guy, Luffy whatever. Of course, they get given the ship by the woman, and she says to the guy in the middle there that, you know, she'll love to hear the stories of him being a captain of the ship or something. So he walks around now, and he thinks he's now the captain of the ship, even though Kaya gave the ship to Luffy, and Luffy said, get your stuff and come aboard. He then thinks he's the captain of the ship, as if Kaya saying it after giving the ship away suddenly makes him captain of the ship. He clearly doesn't. Luffy's still the captain because it was his ship. And of course, the idea that they're the straw hat crew and whatever. Now, whether or not they're going to play up any further, the idea when he says something about crew and Nami and Zoro are like, not crew, we're not crew. Uh, well, you know, in a sense, they're not crew. They haven't really done any crew-like things. Now, we did have the reveal that her little earpiece, where she was using to talk to somebody, whoever that is, is either waterlogged or broken or not working that great at the moment. So maybe we will have a resolution where that will come later on. And I say that simply because they focus the camera on it. So they're generally not going to show us that, unless it has some bearing later on, at least, that's my opinion. Overall, I think the acting is spot on, even, and I've mentioned this previously, even where their eyes are looking at any point in time, where they're looking this way or that way, their reactions, the camera angles, everything is just super interesting and really on point for this series. Yes, each episode is costing, like, almost $20 million, but each episode is almost an hour long. But so far, I'm enjoying it thoroughly. And if you've seen it, let me know what you think down below.